About six months ago, uh, I met Mark Slaughter at a luncheon that's arranged by our good friend Walt Smith, who is uh, executive with the uh, global human resource management firm uh, Dehack and Harrison. And um, I, I talked. I, I, I told Walt to arrange the meeting because um, Mark attended uh, our last fundraiser that was in March when we honored uh, Archie Dunham for the excellence in the lifetime uh, Christian business leadership. And I must admit that in merely uh, 30 minutes of conversation, uh, I was immediately struck by Mark being probably one of the most uh, intelligent and also the most unpretentious and assuming business leader that I ever met. And I have met many of them during my 25 years in business. And uh, so it, it came across as a, a very unusual uh, individual to me. Uh, perhaps reflecting his love for the kingdom, uh, it didn't take long for him to come to agree that uh, he's going to serve on our advisory board. So I, I just said at that time, you know, praise God for what he has done. Uh, I know that Mark is going to make a great contribution uh, to the center and guiding us through the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. I can say a lot more about Mark, but I want to leave that honor uh, a formal introduction to our good friend Walt, uh, because he is a good friend of Mark and he knows him very well. So at this time, I would like Walt to come and introduce Mark. Thank you, Ernest. Actually, you just made my, uh, my introduction to Mark. So I don't really have much to say beyond that. But, uh, you know, I, uh, it is a real privilege for me to be able to introduce uh, Mark Slaughter. As a speaker today, I first met Mark uh, as, uh, as a client uh, some 10 years ago. Um, a client, uh, I was at that time, still am, uh, a career coach for senior executives who are going through career transition. So Mark came in, and I was very impressed at this time. He found a position. Little did I know, within a year, he was back again in transition again. And I began to wonder. I said, this guy really holds a job or not. But I think uh, once you see him today, his, his, uh, what he's done at Brignan especially, that uh, you'll be as impressed as I've been, uh, been with him. Uh, his, his downsizing, by the way, was not because of his performance, but certainly because of corporate uh, reorganization kinds of uh, situations. So not, not to be, uh, but I'll tell you, you know, I've been in the uh, career coaching business for uh, some 15 years now. I worked with uh, senior executives, uh, the CEO of Lake Hughes, Arco, uh, Noble Energy, uh, president of uh, ABC Studios, and this guy is right up there in that class. He is. Uh, take my word for that. And from a, you know, to have that business acumen plus his spirituality is just unmatched. In, in, in the industry that, uh, that we're trying to build and, and make it work. Um, speaking specifically about his performance, uh, in uh, 2007 he joined Brignet. Uh, within six months he became the CEO, president of Brignet, and within three years he took the company public with an IPO. The share price at that time was $12 a share as an IPO. And yesterday it closed at uh, 47, 47. For three years, a 290% uh, growth in three years. He has he's built a, uh, a very solid management team, and he'll talk more about that, I know. But a team that's based uh, with, a, with a culture and a basis of spirituality. That, that works so extremely well. And I know he's, he's, he's head of a global organization. He'll talk with you too about the challenges that he faces. And I've been there in a global organization myself, the challenges that one faces ethically, internationally. So he's been able to work with him. But from the performance, Rignev, I'm sorry I didn't buy stock earlier, then I did. Uh, but that performance has been based on solid earnings, compound annual revenue growth rate of 21%, 21.6% over the period, 
with 2013 revenues of some $200 million. So I do consider that very, very successful business performance and, and a person who's been very blessed uh, to, to have that opportunity. So with that, as he speaks to us today about a Christian's perspective on managing a global business, please welcome Mark Slaughter. Well, thanks to, to Walt. Uh, he's right. I've been a client uh, two times. In fact, uh, for the HBU professors, so what, what's the average life of a CEO? I'm, I'm at seven. It's about three years. And I'm at seven going eight, so I'll, I'll be a client again here at some point. So <laughs> there's no, no question about that. So uh, thank you very much for the inter kind introduction. Also to Dr. Liang and the uh, Center for Christianity and Business, uh, Dr. Sloan and the HBU. So it's a delight to speak to you today. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk today about, as we said, a Christian's perspective on managing a multinational business. So Rigna's a very small company, but it's spread from here to there. In fact, I just got back from two weeks of travel to Asia and the Middle East, and uh, I, I'm global services on United, which is the good news and the bad news. I fly too much. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's been a fun company, uh, and I've, I've enjoyed the seven to eight years there. A little bit about me, I'm not a native Houstonian, but a native Texan, uh, and from Wichita Falls, that's the bottom of Tornado Alley. And I uh, spent my formative years in uh, junior high and high school in Norman, Oklahoma, and the only reason to mention that is that the church my family and I went to, McFarland United Methodist, had as minister of music Dr. John Yarrington who's professor of music here at HBU. So haven't done the, the best job of staying in touch with him and his wife, Diane, but he was certainly a very strong uh, Christian mentor uh, in those early years. And you know, got a love of vocal music that I took on into college and acapella groups and that sort of thing, so a lot of fun. I, I don't sing in the choir today, unfortunately, just in the shower. Um, a little bit about the family. My, my wife's from Oklahoma. We have two daughters, college age, uh, both girls and second. Baptist school. Uh, one was almost a lifer, but not quite, first through 12th grade. Uh, we were overseas during her kindergarten year, and she's now a senior at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where she uh, goes to Austin Stone, a college there, kind of a, a one that meets in a high school. And she is a broadcast journalism major. She's had a couple of fun summer internships. She's worked for both the uh, uh, soccer team here, the Dynamo, as a sports intern, and also Channel 13 as a sports intern. But knowing that uh, a sports broadcast career might lead you to places like Fargo, North Dakota, she's beginning, she's beginning to look at graduate school as maybe as an alternative <laughs> to the long you know, slug of uh, you know, a career in journalism. The other daughter is, uh, is a sophomore at Rice University. She was also a Second Baptist School student through eighth grade and uh, then transferred for maybe some higher academic challenges to St. John's here. Also, she played basketball and had a lot of fun with that, and she's now in biochemistry and probably thinking about a healthcare career at some point, so or early days. So dealing with all that, so we're dealing with all the empty nest issues uh, other than the dog and the wife, right? So we're having, having all of that. So then, then I, I cut, the other board I'm on, I, I'm pleased to join the Center for Christianity and Business, but the other Christian organization I'm associated with is Boys and Girls Country of Houston. I've been on that board now for, I think, four years, maybe it's three years. Uh, this is a, a place in Hockley, Texas, out Highway 290, uh, that's a Christian home for children from families in crisis. So you may or may not have heard of it. Uh, a couple of big fundraising events, a uh, fairly large board, and we have to raise five or six million every year, but we are providing a Christian home for kids who it's not their fault. Uh, they're not you know, into drugs. They're not, uh, they don't have health issues. They were innocent victims of a family that can't support them for, for a number of reasons. And so we provide uh, cottages up in Hockley in a, in a, on a ranch, and uh, maybe 8 to 10 to 12 kids divided by gender and by age. And there's a teaching couple that sits in the middle to, to create a, a family setting. So it's a worthy cause. It's, it's unfortunate it's only 90 kids, but at least it's 90 kids that, that are taken through this. And you know, it's, a, it's, it's a very good organization. So now we turn to vocation. Uh, I'm the CEO of RigNet. And uh, it's, it's an interesting Houston-based company that is about 90% of its business overseas. So we're here because we serve the oil and gas industry. This is where the oil and gas business is based. But most of what we do is done elsewhere. Um, and if, if I'm a good Baptist, I'll talk about the numbers. So, so we, talk, we, uh, 
we have a, um, a network, a global network, that runs between Houston, London, Singapore, back to Houston, from there to 18 teleports and 21 data centers. So that's the core network. From there we reach out to remote sites for oil and gas companies. These are rigs, both offshore and onshore, production facilities onshore and offshore, and energy maritime vessels, and even remote offices in places like Nigeria where they can't count on the terrestrial landlines to keep them connected. So we provide end-to-end -end connectivity between offices and remote sites, and so you can treat that remote site, maybe a rig with 300 people, as just another office on the network. And uh, we serve over 1,100 remote sites today in over 34 countries on six continents. So it's a widely spread business. I mean, there are companies in this town, maybe in one location, who have more revenue than Rignet. So I'm always amazed that we're scattered all around the world and somehow eke out a profit out of this company. Uh, you mentioned we went public. We, uh, the company was founded in 2001 by some Norwegian uh, entrepreneurs with IT backgrounds and, and oil company backgrounds. Um, by 2006, they, as, as is typical for founders, they had reached the limit of their skill sets, and so it was time to bring the MBA in. So, uh, so the adult supervision came in, but the basic vision and strategy for the company, I think, has remained intact. What it needed was some professionalization, which, which is not atypical. Very few founders you know, make it to the point they're running large companies. Now, there's all sorts of exceptions, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Michael Dell, but most are business starters, they're not business managers. So uh, I, I kind of call myself middle inning relief. Right, I've kind of come in midstream. I can't start companies, but if you get one going, maybe I can step in and professionalize it a bit, and that's what our team has done. So uh, while we've enjoyed the success you talked about and the share price growth and a great oil and gas industry to serve, I'm gonna focus more on some of the challenges we've faced in running a multinational company because that's where the lessons are. It's not in the good things, it's in the challenging things. And we've had a couple of uh, what I'd call compliance issues that <coughs> came about for the company that are worth exploring a bit and then thinking about the lessons we've taken forward. And one is, is that we're a U.S. company with a U.S. management team, and yet we're operating in all of these far-flung places that uh, in many ways their business practices in those countries are not congruent with U.S. law. And we've had a couple of uh, incidences that have happened to the company, they're, they're public. One is, is that uh, just after I got there in 2007, uh, about two weeks into my tenure, the CFO walks in my office with bad news and bad news. And the first bit of bad news was we were out of money. And uh, that, that was, uh, that was kind of shocking because I'd moved from United Technologies, a $55 billion company, to a little bitty rig net. And so I'd barely figured out where the vending machine was in the restrooms. And this guy says we're broke, right? And I said, well, you know, what does that mean? There's different definitions of broke, right? And you know, you know how, how bad is it? He said, well, I think we can make payroll in two weeks. Right? And uh, our critical vendors, we can keep going for a bit, but you know, other vendors we're gonna have to push out. And we had a bad credit rating for two years after that. And but we were private equity backed at the time, and so that just means we need another capital infusion. But if you've worked in private equity, they never give you enough money. That's what I found out. I'd never worked in private equity backed businesses before, but they never give you enough. Give you just enough to get you, you know, down the road a bit, but the idea is to keep the pressure on you. All right, and so, but we did get the capital injection and got, got through that piece. Uh, but the other bit of bad news was one that became very troubling. And that is, is that we found what are called some compliance flags, uh, some money, some accounting transactions that didn't seem associated with the business. And by that, I mean there was some cash maybe going to some places it shouldn't. Uh, my radar was already way up on a manager in the Middle East who happened to be a founder of the company because he had a, a business whose market share was too high, right? He had all the business in a certain country, and that doesn't really happen. Uh, then we found that there were some issues around some of the payments and other things going on. So uh, I called the guy and uh, I said, I'm, I'm your new boss. And he said, well, I, I need to tell you something, Mark. He said, uh, one, I'm an important member of Arab society. And this is a Norwegian, right? And <laughs> he said, and, he, and, he, and I found out later he, he was wearing Arab clothes to work. And he would get on camels and go out and be a Bedouin and go out and camp in the desert. You know, he, he, had gone, he had gone local. Do you remember the, the movie uh, 
is it Dances with Wolves with Kevin Costner? And uh, Kevin, Kevin, or the, or the actor, uh, kind of gets, I don't know what happened, he got lost or something, but he ends up getting embedded inside an Indian tribe, and, you know, Stockholm Syndrome takes hold. Next thing you know, the, cow the other cowboys show up, and they said, you turned Indian, did you? And uh, that's what happened to this guy. He went local and, uh, and, and adopted, if you will, the practices of the culture, and we found we had a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act investigation. So as a private company, we're not obligated to tell anybody. You can take an issue like that and go old and cold with it and hope the government doesn't find out. But if they do, the sanctions are pretty severe because you didn't cooperate, you tried to hide it. Uh, I was pleased that our recommendation was embraced by the board, which is let's turn ourselves in. Let's self-report to the Department of Justice and, and find out exactly what happened. And, uh, so we did that. We hired a local law firm now called Norton Rose Fulbright, and that, that, that law firm and I jumped on an airplane, went over to the Middle East and dealt with the matter, but it took us two years and four million dollars to prosecute that matter in front of the government. Uh, that's the cost of not playing straight, not playing with integrity, not playing with transparency, not following laws. A very painful lesson for the company. And at the end of the day, you don't get a clean bill of health from the government. I don't know if anybody's gone through this. Hopefully you haven't. A lot of companies have in this town. Uh, but you get something called a declination letter. It means the, co the uh, government declines to prosecute you, right? And you have to read it about five times. It, it's really scary, right? <laughs> what is this? So the lawyers have to interpret it. And it just says, look, we've, we uh, are not going to prosecute you. You've cooperated. You've, you've done your part. So we're not going to fine you this time. But we're going to keep a file back here. And if we find something new, or if you have another instant like this, then you know, all this comes back out on the table. So we're a scarred company from that standpoint. We actually have a, that we're called a first strike company. We, we've ha we have a check mark against, against us that uh, when we do an acquisition, which we're gonna close on one very soon here, uh, we have to do extra due diligence. Uh, we have to watch ourselves and it's just, it's, it's very painful. Uh, another company in town has a second check, uh, at least two, one is Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes has a court monitor. Do, do people know what that is? Court monitor is not just a, an attorney who sits next to the CEO to let him know when he can go to the bathroom. It's actually an entire legal law firm, or law firm rather, that wraps around Baker Hughes worldwide. Sits in all the offices. And so that's the next step for RigNet if we misstep. Um, on the back of my door I have a hook. And on that hook I have uh, our company color coveralls, they're orange, but they're also there because it could be a jump, you know, prison jumpsuit. So, so but, I, but I, I really do, and I see it every time. And, and uh, I, you know, my job is fun, I get to talk to people, but it's also highly risky. You know, there's Sarbanes-Oxley, I'm signing, signing my life away every quarter, you know, that our financial controls are, are correct, that all the ugly places we're working in around the world that we're operating compliantly, I'm signing away every quarter that that's correct. And so, you know, I've, I've tried to really make that very clear to the management teams around the world. But it just, so, so the prescriptions around that are, we found we did not have a compliance program. And when we started training and teaching the organization about it, we got some interesting responses back. And we would go to Singapore and the Singaporeans would say, we're, we're not US citizens, we're not subject to US law. Right? And we said, well, but you, your <coughs> entity, it may be Singaporean, but it reports to a U.S. company. We serve the U.S. industry, and we have U.S. management teams. We are subject, and it turns out that the U.S. government, if the infraction's severe enough, no matter who you are, they'll come get you. So, you know, we're all subject to it. And so we've had to impress that upon a multinational populace that wasn't aware of U.S. and really U.K. law and how it applies. And, and so that's, that's been a very important lesson for us. Secondly, dealing with the guy in the Arab robes, uh, we go through management rotations. And uh, there's a phrase I learned in <coughs> business school several years ago called, uh, a term called availability heuristic. Have you heard of that? That's, uh, that's one of those $10 words I used to use in job interviews after I heard it, because it, so it sounds smart. Um, but it just means that if you're there in the Middle East, you may come across as an American, you may come across with your values, your Christian values, your US values, and you get in there, but every day you're there, they're getting eroded. And so after some period of time, and it differs by individual, you will eventually figure out locally that you'll draw conclusions, that's the way the world works, and you'll then cross the line. And it's usually not a big step, it's a set of little steps, and pretty soon you've gone away from your values so much that you may be breaking U.S. law. So one of the ways we deal with that is frequent rotations of our managers between countries, 
Uh, we also have internal audit. We also we, we watch. I travel the world. Uh, we're kind of looking people in the eyes to make sure that you know they're not doing something they shouldn't because the penalties are so severe. So that's lesson one. Um, lesson two is one that the first deal happened on somebody else's watch and I had to clean it up. The second issue is one that happened on my watch. Uh, fortunately, I'm still standing here, but this is one we re reported publicly um, about this time last year, maybe, maybe about 10 months ago. And this has to do with another part of U.S. law called sanctioned countries. If I ask you to name the five sanctioned countries, could people, could you name the five where U.S. companies cannot operate? You name two of them? Uh, two, two of them. Sorry? Not Libya anymore. Libya used to be, but not anymore. Uh, it, yeah, North Korea, yeah, uh, Iran, uh, Syria, Cuba, Syria, and the Sudan are the current five today. Two of those really only matter from an oil and gas perspective, you know, Iran and the Sudan today. Uh, maybe a couple of the others do, but, but really uh, what, what happened was in 2009, um, we had a Chinese drilling company move some rigs into one of those five countries, and we can't serve them. So uh, what was interesting was our first incident was in 2007, so the management team out, in the, out somewhere overseas calls and says, hey, they're moving to XYZ country. We, we've learned we can't do that. So, ah, so it's, it's surface. Everything's going to be fine. So we, we call Fulbright and Jaworski, get our legal opinion, communicate that out to the team as to what to do. And we had to pull our equipment off the rig. Uh, we could not assist them in any way whatsoever. Uh, then, then several years passed, and then four years later, I find out that this issue has come up again, and there's a problem. And I said, well, this was a known issue. How could there be an issue? Well, the local team did an audible uh, at the edge, and what they did was is that the law further says that you cannot assist. And this was a client, a, a Chinese client, still a client today, that, um, that uh, works in sanctioned countries, but also works in countries we can work in. So they're actually an active client. And so our team felt compelled to say, well, we can't serve you, but go down the street and call on this company. Well, that's just as bad as breaking the law and uh, as serving them inside of, of, of a sanctioned country and providing any assistance whatsoever. The law is designed such that you're not providing any assistance to that local economy. So now we have another issue, right? And so now we've spent $1.7 million, right, on this deal so far, so, right? So it just, it just says again that you know, managing multinational populations, uh, highly attentive into these countries, and we work in a lot of harsh, ugly, in many cases, corrupt markets around the world, and we've got to be ever vigilant. And so that's just been an absolutely tremendous challenge for us. Uh, one member of our board of directors who also runs a multinational business says, you just know that somebody somewhere is doing something, and you just got to find it. So, you know, we're hyper vigilant. Uh, we've, you know, had two, two major instances, both of which have been reported. So as a public company, I'm not telling you something that's inside information, but it just points out that, you know, getting the values right in the company, getting the behaviors right is, is absolutely paramount, but it's also complicated if you're dealing in a multinational setting where the norms of business, for example, the Chinese companies that, uh, that we were working for, that, uh, they didn't break U.S. law, we did. You know, they're, they're allowed by the government, or by the laws of China to operate in, in, some, in these countries. They don't have, face the same sanctions, but we can't. And so they didn't do anything wrong, we did. And that's, that's what you have to learn is that a U.S. company faces extra constraints. But we wear the compliance uh, as, or, or treat compliance as a badge of honor. Uh, most of the companies we do work for are Western companies, even though we do work for Asian companies as well. Uh, they need a compliance supplier. And uh, so, you know, it's very important that we fit into that ecosystem and that we're a choice for them. That's that, you know, we're very committed to compliance and, and, you know, that needs to be part of our value proposition. We shouldn't hide from it, shouldn't cheat. We should be straightforward and, and honest and, and operate with integrity. So those are kind of the two, the two uh, incidences I want to talk about there. On the softer side, um, we're about to buy a company from Inmarsat, one of the leading satellite operators. And, I could almost say something now. I think Dr. Sloan said, wait till Monday for something, so I'll just leave it at that. But uh, there, we'd announced that we're buying a company that includes a 40,000 square mile microwave network in the Gulf of Mexico. That is gonna serve, this thing keeps going off and on, um, is gonna serve the, uh, the uh, drilling and production industry offshore. 
We're very excited about that. We're also tapping into some new satellite technology they're launching, and that's a deal that we've said is going to close sometime this quarter, and probably closer to this part of the quarter than the end, end of the quarter. So we'll you know, just watch for a press release, but we're, we're excited about that deal. But it's giving us an opportunity on the soft side to redefine the cultures in each company and build a combined culture. And we're, we're known as a company that's highly performing. You know, the share price is no accident, but, uh, but you know, we drive the business hard. We're chronically understaffed. We run around the clock like any oil field services company. And we've been known as not being the nicest to employees that we could be just because we run so hard. We've, we've put customers first, which you kind of have to, but we're adopting a new mantra that starts with happy employees lead to happy, happy customers lead to happy investors. And so it's got to start with an employee base that you're asking to go above and beyond that you know, needs to be motivated. You can't just pound the employee base and expect it to continue to go above and beyond day after day. People have to want to, they have to feel that passion. Uh, and that's what we're trying to build in the culture is take our high performance culture and take this Inmarsat business we're acquiring that maybe doesn't perform as well. Uh, if you look at the press releases, you can, you can see their, their margins, their revenue growth rates, all of that are far below ours. But what they do a good job of is embracing the employee population in ways that we can further embrace and we can build a culture that will be a winning team and a winning culture and be high performing. We, we want the best of both. Um, against that are a set of values that, while I, you know, we're not going to hold Bible studies around the company, uh, just because of the multicultural setting, they can be biblically based, uh, values that are informed by biblical absolutes, and those values manifest themselves in behaviors that, that can work across the company, and, and it's both an imperative, I, th I think, in terms of driving a, a business with integrity, with transparency, uh, with servant leadership, but also it's an imperative because I can't just manage a business anymore of this size. It's got to be led and it's got to be built to last. It's got to be able to survive me and the, the leadership. It's got to have its own culture and values and processes. So that's what we're trying to build. Uh, after I was asked by Dr. Liang to speak, uh, I had the, maybe it was God's hand, but all of a sudden I was invited to a Christian CEO dinner uh, here maybe, I think it was last November, and Jim Hackett, the former CEO of Anadarko, was the, was the guest speaker. And pretty interesting, I was taking copious notes and I think his secretary sent around uh, some, some of the remarks from his speech that were pretty insightful and I was gonna pass, pass it along but also give, you attribution, give attribution to him as well. He's the, uh, was an, uh, is an unabashed Christian uh, Catholic by, by faith. Uh, he has retired sitting on boards, but he's going to Harvard Divinity School, right? Pr pretty interesting. And, uh, and he's a, you know, fit, good-looking, sort of athletic, look, you know, sort of guy. I have to s struggle to keep the weight down. And a very interesting guy. Um, and he talks about what you call dangerous men, and that is, you know, can a Christian, you know, s a person in leadership, can they be effective in business when so many people aren't? Is, you know, is, is the business world one place where Christianity doesn't work? That's probably my wife calling this. <laughs> but, um, and um, can, can you be that? And, I, and I'm convinced you can. And he, he described it this way. He called it the, the, you have to have the shrewdness of the serpent and yet the innocence of a dove. And by that, you've got to play business aggressively. You, know, you shouldn't be, apologize for that. But you ha your behavior has to be beyond reproach. Right? You've got to win, but win the right way. And you know, we preach that in, a, in kind of a secular fashion inside the company is that you know, we always pressure our managers around the world to make their numbers. We put very aggressive growth targets on people. We, you know, we want to grow that 15 to 20 percent a year, but we also say never cut corners. There's never any pressure to bend the rules, to, to break laws locally or break U.S. laws or break policy. And in fact, you know, we tell people, if you, you know, if you get in trouble out there and you've sought our advice, we'll defend you to the end of the earth. But if you break the law, do something, and you just kind of went on your own, we'll let you twist in the wind. And uh, we're very clear about that, is that, you know, we're going to run this thing with integrity. We want to win the right way. We want to be able to look ourselves in the mirror as a company. And I think so far we've been able to show that. We certainly have had our issues and our scar tissue that's come from, from building RigNet. But we are building a company that can last and we think are built on the right set of values that we can take forward. So that's really, it's a, it, he, uh, Jim Hackett <coughs> talked about being dangerous men. It's being a, a Christian in a secular setting. 
and that's a, a dangerous thing for everybody else. It can also be dangerous for the Christian. You know, Christians have been persecuted, certainly. Um, but uh, I'm convinced it's a formula that can work, uh, has worked at Regnat, and we hope will con you know, continue to work. And any results of that company are not mine or not the employees. The, those results go to him and hopefully is a reflection of, 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 of God's grace on, on the company and that we're following his word. So with that, those are kind of my remarks. Um, be open, I think, I think the forum is such that we can ask, you know, ask a few questions, either about RigNet or anything. Yes, sir. I'll start, Mark. First off, thank you for the message today. And congratulations yes. on your success. Through the, the three years of, of taking it private to go public, how important, how did you use your board of directors? How important is your board of directors? How do they act as your mentor, your guide? Give us some insight to your corporate governance process. Yeah, that, that, that's been a pretty dramatic transformation. When you're private equity backed, uh, the board members are the investors and the owners. Uh, as a public company, those investors, or the board members are independent. They may own a few shares, but they're not the owners of the company. So it, it is a bit different. Uh, the, in the old days, you know, they would roll their sleeves up alongside you and be really kind of part of management. Uh, now, like they owned you, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> like, like they have you, and they do. Uh, today, the board really is an oversight board. Uh, what you have to be careful of, I think, in the balance in a public board is what they call guidance versus governance. If, you, if, you're not, if, you're, if you're too careful and you're just sitting there worrying about dotting the I's and crossing the T's and comply, complying with all your SEC filings, there's no strategic advice from the board. And I had that kind of ad nauseum when we were private, very little about governance because we weren't public, but now we got to make sure the pendulum doesn't go too far the other way. It'd be, you know, you can have nice, pretty SEC documents, but do you have the sort of advice and oversight you need to guide the business from the board level? And I, th I think we've got a good fit there. How did you deal with the analysts in your quarterly calls when you were going through those challenges you mentioned? Because they can be pretty, in, pretty tough. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an art. Um, and when it's an art, they can go one way and go the wrong way. Um, what, what happens is there's the public call, and the comments are in there. You can go back and look at our earnings transcripts, and then as soon as you hang up, all the phone calls come in. So really where all the action happens is what you say in those private sessions. And I, th I think, you know, we kept our self-confidence around it. We said, look, we've found it. We're dealing with it. Uh, we think we have it contained. Uh, we dealt with the people. You know, I personally flew out to Singapore and, you know, personnel situation, so we had the thing we felt cleaned up, communicated, and I, th I think the market, you know, quickly looked past that. They, they, wanted to, they wanted to know basically the financial magnitude of it, and was it systemic, and, you know, we, we're still convinced it's not systemic, right, but uh, if that's the case, then they, they get comfortable, but it's also the passage of time. Thank you. Yes, sir. How did you, when you went public, how did you build the board? What, what kind of criteria did you establish? How did that transpire? How did, it, how did you select those folks? Well, we, well, first of all, we hired a chairman in advance, uh, a gentleman named Tom Matthews, who has since retired from the board, but he is a guy that's run several, I think, four Fortune 500 companies. So there was a been there, done that chairman, not non-executive chairman. And we built an authorization matrix, or, or I'm sorry, not author, a, a skills matrix for the board. And what it would say is, what, what do you need on there? You need financial experts, you know, because you have to populate committees. You have to think about uh, age and where you are in your career, because you need board members who have some time for committees. So you need some members who are retired, but recently retired, but you also need some active ones who have good networks in the industry you're, you're looking at. We're, we also play in the intersection between telecom and oil and gas, so we needed a mixture of those two verticals. And we're mostly overseas, and we may be lightest on that, but we need people not just U.S.-centric, but we need international perspectives mm -hmm. on the board. Uh, there's also, I, I think I mentioned the financial experts. You have to have two or three financial experts to sit on the audit committee and who are familiar with U.S. accounting and GAAP accounting. Uh, so I think with all of that, we put that grid together. We went to a local search firm, Spencer Stewart, and they, they helped us you know, fill out the rest of that board. Yes, sir. came in from the outside, they already had their mentality and they already had their, their thought process. Hmm. As far as that compliance issue, and I work in the banking industry, and I can tell you that from even from a public company to a private company, there's two different mentalities altogether. One 
board of directors that own the company, that's one thing because they're constantly saying, yeah, that's compliance, but we got profit margins that we have to hit. How do you meet that challenge without, you know, you're having to tell them about their company. How do you, how do you address that? Uh, you know, where the board is both the board and the owners? Right. Well, first of all, when I came in, I was brought in by them uh, to, to replace the founders, and, and a CFO was also brought in. So he, so he and I quickly figured out we were the only two guys we could trust. And when we found this compliance <laughs> issue, I didn't, I, I didn't trust the board or management or anybody. I, you, you start with, okay, you, there's a question mark around the entire environment around RigNet. I'll clear you one by one. So I had the board in the gun sites too. Maybe they were complicit. You know, did they know about what was going on in the Middle East and were wanting to keep the margins and like the 100% market share and those sorts of things? And because uh, they were trying to sell the business, right? But uh, we ultimately found out or, or reached a reasonable conclusion. They, they were not aware. And uh, in fact, uh, I came in as COO, uh, the CEO was aware and had taken actions insufficient to deal with it because he liked the results and uh, you know, he paid the price. So that's the way, way it works. <laughs> yes, yes sir. How do you handle, how do you, when you initiate Christian practice, how do you implement it and uh, any objections from the I, yeah, I think inside the company, peop, you know, people know I'm a Christian and that you know, I'm a member of you know, Second Baptist, but I don't beat people on the head with it. Uh, also, uh, you know, we don't hold Bible studies in there, so it's, it's, not, it's, it's not in my writings, but I, I think people hopefully can, as some people say, can they tell by your behavior whether you're a Christian or not? Hopefully they, they see that. And I, it's, it's, it's challenging, because I think even in, in a, if we were just a Houston office, uh, there's liabilities for a CEO to hold Bible studies, because all of a sudden there you could be accused in a workplace environment of being discriminatory. So you could have other employees host Bible studies in which you attend, right? That, that can happen, but I think for me to sponsor things as, as the leader uh, leads to all sorts of exposures for the company and for me. Uh, but I think what we try to do is recognize there are multiple faiths inside the company. Uh, there are probably some agnostics and some atheists around as well. We have a range of, of religions, and I, th I, I try to show respect. You know, I go to the Middle East a lot, and there's the five times you pray uh, to Mecca that goes on, and you know, you'll have a meeting that just gets interrupted while the customer steps out to take his shoes off and go pray. And respectful, I don't you know, necessarily believe in it, <laughs> don't believe in it, but on the other hand, I have to respect that, that culture and that, and that religion. And I'm hope, hopefully I'm accorded the same. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What advice would you have um, when you're dealing with different cultures and different cultural backgrounds when you come across a particular culture that has questionable business ethics? Specifically, they don't honor the contract they sign. As a Christian, do you fight it? Oh. Or do you do you take a different approach? What, is, what advice would you give other leaders? Well, 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 I think you have to follow the law, and you have to follow your contract. So if you you know, if if there's any culture that is pressed, it's the U.S. culture that's pressed outward. And if I get any pushback inside our culture, it's the fact that I'm pushing you know U.S. business practices. Uh, I want to be respectful of other cultures, but you know, the, the when we told the Department of Justice, for example, that the custodians of the issue, that's their phraseology for the perpetrators, if you will, were Norwegian. They said, ah, that explains a lot. <laughs> uh, and so, which was kind of interesting because uh, they tend to, uh, any Norwegians here? <laughs> but, uh, but they tend to, they, you yeah, know, they're, they're Western, but they tend, to, and it's, it's, it's much to, too much to generalize, but they tend to reach a different moral conclusion. They're willing to, to bend the rules a bit more as business people. And uh, that, that explained a lot to the U.S. government and, and to us. And our, our roots are Norwegian, which is what I had to root out of the place, right, to, to build a, a successful business that will last. Yes, sir. So what are your plans with regard to RigNet? Are you going to look 20, 20 more years? Or? Well, I'm 55, so I'm, I'm trying to build it with succession. The first order of business for me as a public CEO is who takes my place. So I'm working uh, actively. I run the process. The board makes the decision. So I've you know, got several developed candidates. Uh, there's an emergency board member. So that's, that's job one. Our strategy, though, is to continue to build the business. 
Uh, we've had a couple things. We're about to close on this acquisition. Uh, KKR, Colbert Kravitz Roberts, has bought a 28% stake in the company. They scared me to death last summer when they called us because yeah, they're just a minority holder, but you know that's barbarians at the gate. If, for the younger folks, you have no idea what that is, but, but they were a, a notorious takeover shop, right, and fairly ruthless, and the same in KKR, those guys are still there, but they, they are much different, and we've been very <coughs> pleased with them. They're a very capable private equity firm, and so we're tapping into their consulting business, uh, some of their procurement savings, so when we fly on airplanes and get hotel rooms today, we do it based on the buying volumes of 90 companies they own. So we get access to that. So when we, when we buy Cisco uh, networking gear, we, we buy it at a much deeper discount now. Why? Because they want our profits to go up and our share price to go up. So they bought in at 30, we're at 46 in four months. So I think they're pretty happy, but they want 120 a share, so. <laughs> so. Market's known to be lonely at the top. And what advice can you share with our group? <coughs> What network do you have? What mentors group? Is there a group of CEOs, like CEOs, either from your industry or disparate companies? Is there a group that you go to for, for advice and consultation? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, I, and I will say it is, it is lonely. Uh, you get managed, right? So I do a couple things inside the company. I don't just rely on direct reports. I get on an airplane, I go around. And so getting all the way out to the front lines, listening, keeping your chain of command open and working around and through functions and below levels is very valuable to staying in touch with the company. Uh, I consult a lot with the board and I think the board generally has my best interests at heart. Now, I work for them, so you know, there's, there's, but I also have, I think, some trusted colleagues, I would say kind of in the Houston business community that uh, are not competitors, they, they have no agenda. Uh, Walt at times has been that for me, uh, where I can go take an issue and uh, you know, I have to be sensitive that it could be something that you know, is inside information on RigNet, but for general issues, I can take those and feel I'm getting fair and objective counsel. And I think that's pretty critical because uh, you know, I get managed. Anybody does in this role. You know, your reports are managing things. I tend to, I won't say overreact, but I, I will get engaged if I'm brought something. And so I get managed. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And speaking about uh, relating to your employees differently in a more positive way, uh, because the culture of an organization is always is always set by its leadership team, how much emphasis is being placed on changing their mindset? Changing the employees or the mindset of, of the leadership, leadership team? Well, I think that starts with me. Uh, this, this culture and values exercise we're going through in the combined company that's about to form up, we're going to be meeting all around the world. And uh, I personally have to lead that. Uh, I've been in a company where uh, the CEO did not embrace the sort of culture and values transformation we're trying to go through. He pushed it to HR and the thing died. So it has to start with me. I've got to change, right? And then that shadow of the leader, tone from the top, however you want to describe it, has to start with me. It'll you know, permeate the, the senior leadership and from there we've got to live the values, right, in our behaviors. <laughs> well, I'm saying it. Let's see if I live it, right? I've got to, got to walk the walk too. And, it, and it's hard. You know, we're busy, so. Do you encourage Bible studies within your company? And if you do, do you get pushed back from HR? From HR? I, I have a very good Christian friend I talked to about this, and I, I mentioned this more in this direction as well. I, I do not. I think there's liability as a CEO and for the company to do that uh, because you, you can end up getting into workplace issues. Uh, I would not discourage it if a frontline employee did organize it. Right, you know, outside of work hours, and I might attend. Uh, but what I have to be careful of if you know, we have you know Christian Bible studies, and certain people come, and then their careers start advancing, and others don't. You know, it just it just creates a you know can create an issue. So I don't try to bash people. I when I worked at Halliburton years ago, there was a president, Dale Jones, good Southern Baptist, and he would always put a very you know it was very clear he was a Christian, but he would put it in all his writings all around the world, and so. He ended up offending a lot of the faiths, and of course, as as a Christian, you might say, "Well, I don't care if I offend you or not." But in a business setting, you know, he was alienating, you know, 40,000 employees by some of his comments, and I, I kind of watch that a little bit. I think there's other ways to exhibit faith in the Christian faith without necessarily beating people on the head inside of a multinational work setting. Yes. Yeah, well, that's been my whole, whole talk today. We, most of the places we work in, 
you know, bribes are there. Let, let me just, exp I, I just two weeks ago I was in Beijing. And then uh, that, in the Asian culture, I know there's, there's, there are many from China, lots of gifts, right? Well, those, uh, I met with the number three person in Ch uh, CNOC, which is one of the national oil companies there. We exchange gifts. I had to get pre-clearance to hand him what I handed him, and I got a gift back. You know, I'm trying to get his business. I had so many gifts by the time of two days in Beijing, I had to mail them back. <laughs> I couldn't put them in my suitcase. You know, I've got, I've got year of the horse this and year of the horse that, you know, because it's Chinese New Year. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, but, it, but you have to be careful. And, and, and that's the point is that when you get U.S. Man we typically put U.S. managers in these places because they will follow U.S. law and they've been trained and we trust them. Uh, but that, but when you live locally and you see all your competitors doing something different, you eventually your values get eroded to the point that you may cross the line, and that's what I was talking about. We we move managers so they don't get corrupted by the local culture, and because it's completely normal in those. What what goes on in China is entirely proper in China. It's just not always congruent with U.S. law. That's the difference. And let me tell you, U.S. companies, we're the most handicapped companies in the world in terms of operating outside the United States. It's amazing we even make money, you know, if you think about it. We're held to a higher standard. Yes, sir. Why are you a company? Um, <laughs> well, we've, we've looked at that, but more from, well, there, that, that's kind of a moral question, too. Could we then break the law if we were back somewhere else? Well, no, the answer is no, because we have U.S. You wouldn't be breaking their law. Yeah, but, but I'm a U.S. manager, and we have U.S. business interests. So you never escape it. Uh, we have looked at it from a tax standpoint, uh, yeah. but... But that's very tough as well because you have to kind of write a big check to leave. Exactly. But, but, we've, <laughs> but we've looked at that. Uh, and many companies in this town are really here, but they are domiciled outside the United States. Several of the drilling customers who work for are in Switzerland, right? Which is kind of offshore drillers in Switzerland is kind of bizarre, isn't it? Because <laughs> there's no one. <laughs> anyway. If you can, I have one more question, please. Yes, sir. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is like you were a few years ago, an American executive who's about ready to join a team that's predominantly or largely Norwegian. What, oh. you commented a little bit on a difference, but what the, were some of the learnings you had? I love Norway. So, <laughs> I do. Um, a couple things around it. What I've noticed is we'll, we'll uh, generate announcements from Houston. And this is our mecca, right, within RigNet. And we'll put announcements out, and the Norwegians will gripe, well, we need to be consulted before, you know, announcements come out. And so there's a bit more of a uh, kind of a, you know, I don't know what you'd say exactly, but just a sense of kind of a, almost unionized, even though there, there are light unions over there. That's part of it. Uh, secondly, there's, they, they balance work-life, uh, you know, the, the play and the work side much better than Americans. When they work, they work hard. They just don't work nearly as hard as we do. And uh, that's been a rub. Uh, you know, we don't, at least in our company, we work 24-7. You know, I may take a vacation, but I got my iPhone the whole time. Uh, they take their time off, and I think that's, that's something as well. But I think sometimes the subtleties in the cultures, you've got you've to really search out and you can really trip up badly and come across as a brash American. I even sent a, a Norwegian national to Norway who had gone to Rice University and had been over here for 15 years, uh, even prior to RigNet. So he was an American Norwegian and they hated him. We put him over there and he worked around the clock and you know, they just said he's, a, he, he's an American who you know, speaks the language. You know? <laughs> so, anyway, hope that helps. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Well, we do have this small gift for Mark, and uh, this is not from China. No, not from China. No. Let me enjoy the, uh, the, yeah, the horse. Yeah, you're the horse. <laughs> Thank you.